Okay, so I want to start out by giving a little bit of credibility to myself on fire because otherwise I'm, people are going to throw stuff at me. Um, I'm not anti-fire. I've been a burn boss for 25 years. I've burned, I've bossed over 200 burns. Um, I, I'm one of the co-founders of the whole patch burn grazing working group. So I'm not anti-patch burn grazing. I'm not anti-fire. I just want to get that out there right now. <clears throat> but I did want to ask a question. Um, and, and part of this is to be provocative, and part of it is a serious question, which is why, why, what if we didn't use fire? And then I'm going to hide behind a brick wall so people don't throw things at me, because this is the wrong place to ask that question. And that's not actually the right question. The, the question is more this one, which is, what if we don't have to use fire every year? Or another way of framing that is, what if we didn't have to have fire that drove a grazing system? Um, is that more acceptable? OK. Um, but we could still use fire sometimes if we wanted to deal with brush control or if we wanted to adjust grazing distribution or have other objectives. Or we could burn, what if we could just burn when we had the time to burn either year to year or within the seasons? Like what if it worked better to burn in the summer instead of the spring and it doesn't affect the grazing system? Um, and what about years when we can't get a permit? It'd be really nice to have a grazing system that doesn't fall apart because we can't get the burn the fire chief to give us a permit, right? So again, I'm a huge fan of patch burn grazing. Boy, the colors on this are going to be messy. Um, and the reason that I got interested in patch burn grazing was for these three things, um, primarily habitat heterogeneity. In fact, Sam and I were talking this morning that you know when we started that group. The, called the Patch Burn Grazing Working Group, we really wanted to call it the Habitat Heterogeneity Group, but it just didn't stick. And most of us were using Patch Burn Grazing, so we just kind of went back to there. But Habitat Heterogeneity was the goal from the beginning, still is. Um, but I also wanted something that gave livestock access to good forage all year, because that's the only way we're going to get any system to be widespread. And we need, obviously, like Sam just said, we need to have control of woody vegetation if this is going to uh, be relevant in the world, uh, in the Great Plains especially. So I'm not going to go through what patch burn grazing is. Everybody knows what that is. This gets to Scott's question earlier about the sandhills, I think, is that I see a bunch of challenges with patch burn grazing in terms of implementing it in Nebraska. And one of the biggest ones is we're just getting to the point where people are starting to use fire more but it's still really challenging to put fire on the ground for most ranchers. And having to do multiple fires a year is really tough to think about. It's hard enough to get one fire a done year. So if you're a rancher and you've got several management units or several pastures in different places and you were going to use patch burn grazing on each of those, that means that every one of your pastures has to have a fire every year to drive that system or every couple of years if you're going to get really crazy with your patch burning. Again, I, I just don't know if that's logistically feasible in most of Nebraska right now. Also, Sam <laughs> talked about this too, a lot of people have spent a lot of money splitting pastures into little pieces and building cross fences. So now we're going to go in and we're going to say, hey, we don't want you to use all that stuff that you just spent a bunch of money on. We have a better idea. I just, I don't see that going over very well with most people. It yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then the last one is probably the hardest one, and I don't know that I can solve this one for us, but it's just weird. It's not what most of us have been taught. It looks crazy. The hardest thing I think for me when I describe patch burn grazing to ranchers is getting past the idea that we're overgrazing this part of the pasture, which is destroying the grassland, right? And we're undergrazing this over here, which is wasteful because you've got all this grass you're not using. And it just runs against everything that most ranchers have grown up hearing about. And so it's a, very, it's a really tough sell. Ecologically, I think there's also this challenge for me as somebody who cares about plant diversity, um, and I'm sure everybody in the room agrees with that, but there are these plants that cows will eat everywhere, no matter whether it's in the burn patch or the unburned patch, and that's almost irregardless of scale. Like it helps to have a bigger pasture, they can hide a little bit, but things like Canada milk fetch or common milkweed or entire leaf rosin weed, on our sites on the Platte River, for example, the cows eat those to the ground everywhere in the pasture, regardless of whether it was burned or not. And if that continues for very long, we're going to lose some of those plant species, which is not good from a plant diversity standpoint, from an ecological resilience standpoint. And as an example of the milkweed thing, uh, this is a picture where 
This milkweed plant got the flower nipped off of it two days after those cows came in, and a week later, that whole patch of milkweed looked like that. So those cows came in, in in late June, early July, I can't remember which, and not only did they, did they eat it, they stripped the leaves off of mature plants because they liked milkweed that much. So if you're someone who doesn't think cows like milkweed, you're just wrong, <laughs> uh, at least in our areas here. So rest rotation system is one way you can create some heterogeneity because you can graze three pastures a year and leave one, right? So you start in pasture A, later in the season you move to pasture B, later in the season you move them all to pasture C, you leave pasture D, and you get a little bit of difference because pasture D is going to get a little taller. But on Sam's really nice uh, chart without error bars, you know, it was still, still in this area, right? Not, not on the heterogeneity side. But this is how a lot, I mean, that's what a lot of pastures are set up to do, is some kind of a rotational system, even though, well, and, and the, the reason that rotational grazing was designed was to, to decrease heterogeneity, right? And it's to, to not ever hurt the grass. It's to promote grass dominance and even use of a pasture. Both of those things run completely against what we want from a heterogeneity, wildlife, habitat, ecological resilience standpoint. Too much grass dominance reduces plant diversity, which reduces the resilience of a pasture, to climate, to drought, to insect abundance, or insect pests, all those things. And even use across the pasture decreases wildlife habitat. So we don't want either of those two things, but that's what rotational grazing was set up to do. So what I'm gonna propose now and what I've been using for a while, uh, both on my own prairie and at some of the Nature Conservancy land on the Platte River now, is this idea of an open gate rotational system. So I'm gonna show you a four pasture example. You can do this with any number of pastures, it doesn't matter. It's more of a principle than a system. Mm -hmm. And it's not a complicated thing and it's not something that I necessarily invented, but it's just something that we've been using. And the only thing that's, that's different about it is when I start in pasture A, we let the cows graze that, as, as short as we feel like grazing it, usually pretty short because we're trying, trying to get heterogeneity. And then we open the gate and let them into pasture B and we just leave the gate open. It's not technically challenging. Um, and what happens is those cows graze in pasture B but they keep coming back to A because that's where the regrowth is. And they're getting the same benefits of the regrowth, the nutritional value of their regrowth that, that they would get if we had burned pasture A instead of fencing it. So it's the same attractions principle, but the cows have a choice, which is, you know, Sam was talking about the value of giving those cows a choice. Cows are really good at regulating their diets. They know what they're doing. And if you force them into a small area, they'll eat what's there because they have to. But if you give them a bigger area, they'll wander around and they'll find the things that they really want. And so in a system like this, they can move into this new area and they'll graze the tips of all the grasses there, but they keep coming back to the regrowth here because that's still the most nutritious forage they have. And we're not excluding them from that option. And then later in the system, or later in the year, if we want to and if we need it, we've got pasture C, we can open that up, and now they've got three different pastures they can move through to choose what they want to graze. So they'll still be coming back to the first one, they'll graze the second one quite a bit, and by the end of the season, they'll come in and they'll graze C if we need them to. A lot of years in the systems that, or the pastures that I'm running, um, we don't often use that third pasture because we just, we can hit those first two pretty hard. So at the end of that year, we've got the pasture they started in, which gets grazed intensively all season long. It's gonna be, you know, an inch tall. We've got the second one that gets grazed pretty hard, so it might be, you know, four, six inches tall, real patchy. If we use the third one at all, it's very light, and it's at the end of the season when most of those grasses are dormant and the grazing is not going to have an impact on them anyway, so it's still going to be pretty tall. And then we've got this really fun one over here, which is the key to the whole system, I think, in terms of heterogeneity, which is the recovery patch that's in its first year of rest from being grazed hard. So I want to show you that from a photo standpoint. This is our family prairie. So here's the pasture that has been grazed all season. It's really short. If the, if the screen quality and the projector quality was better, you'd see there's a lot of ragweed out there that's been ungrazed. You've got the one that we went into second, mid-season, where the grass is still, you know, you can, this is my, uh, my high-tech uh, 
pasture monitoring tool. And you can see how much of the spade there is, is accessible. So there's still some cover there, but not a lot. This one is the one that had this. The, tr the previous two years got grazed really hard. It's had one season to start recovering. So the structure is better. It's covering up the base of the shovel there, the blade of the shovel. But it's really weedy and messy. And this one hasn't been grazed for two years. And so big blue stem is nice and tall and dense. There's a lot of wildflowers uh, in there as well. Not as many as here, but still a lot. And this is the one that's available to at, the, at the end of the season if we want it to graze late. So at the end of that year then, when you go into the next year, basically all you do is you just move everything around one, one set. And the one that we got, that got grazed really hard all of last year, this next year is going to get rest. It starts its full, full season, first full, full season rest. Um, the one that was grazed only the last half of the season becomes the one that's grazed all season. So it's really going to get hammered. And then, uh, let's see, the one that was in its first year of recovery now gets its second year of recovery. And the, the one that came out of its, its two years of rest is now available to be grazed. That's the way the system works. Another, another way to look at it is if you look at one pasture through time, it gets grazed the last half of one season, the next year it gets grazed all season, and then it gets two years of rest. So exactly what Sam was talking about, the only difference is there's no fire. But you can use fire. And I'm not, and I think we should use fire. So you have, you know, a lot of the pasture is gonna look like this during the dormant season when it's easy to burn or during the summer. So you can burn as much of a ha as half of the pasture every year if you want to. So if you're really dealing with brush control and you want to burn frequently, you can do that with this. But if you want to burn every four or five years or every eight years, you can do it with this too because you're going to have a portion every year of that pasture that's got enough fuel built up to allow fire. But you don't have to burn to run the system. So you get intense grazing and you get the wildlife that were on this side of, of Sam's pictures up there. The birds, the, the lizards, the small mammals, the insects, all, all those things are on this end. That looks fine. And this is what makes ranchers uncomfortable, right? Including a bunch of people in the room, I'm guessing, now. But then you get the fun party of forbs, wildflowers, weedy stuff, um, in, the, in the reverse recovery year, which if you're talking about wildlife, this is the most valuable of all those, I would argue. It's, it's your bird rearing cover for quail and grouse and pheasants. It's the highest abundance of insects, which is the food for a lot of the wildlife we're looking at. It's the more patchy, it's the, it's the areas where, you know, animals can run along the ground but be undercover. It's all those things combined, plus plant diversity, which is great from a pollinator standpoint. Boy, this is a terrible projector. <laughs> um, and also, because of the recovery and the complete exclusion, you get things like Canada milkfetch, which is one of those ice cream plants. You get rosinweed, which is an ice cream plant. You get, you get common milkweed they get a chance to bloom and keep themselves in that system. So patch burn grazing is really great. I've been using it for 25 years. I'm gonna keep using it. I love it. I think it's really helpful, but I don't think it meets the objectives of everybody. And it's really challenging, again, to pull off fires every year with this open gate idea. It facilitates fire. It allows fire to be used and, and effectively because you can get two years of growth built up and really kill some cedar trees if you want or do whatever else you want to do with fire, but you don't have to use fire to make the system work. It uses the infrastructure that's been built and takes advantage of it in a different way, but you, you don't, you're not wasting, if that's, an, if that's an objection, you're not wasting the water sources and the fence that you put in. The last one, the weirdness part, it's still weird, and, and we're not gonna get away from that for a while. At some point, people will catch up with Sam and agree that heterogeneity is the rule that we should all follow. In the meantime, it's gonna be weird. One of the, I think there's, there's sort of two parts that make people really uncomfortable with that, intensive grazing especially. One is worry about killing grass, right? If you overgraze that grass, you're gonna hurt that grass and, and the grass is what we're making our living on. That's easy to show because we can just take you out to a patch burn site or an open gate site. You look across the fence and you say, or out, outside the burned area and the grass looks great. The recovery of grass is easy to show. 
what we don't have enough data on, we just talked about this this morning, what we don't have enough data is on the soil impacts, which is the other big objection we're going to hear from ranchers on, that we do hear from ranchers about. And so we've got some pilot data from an open gate site along the Platte, working with Greg Peck, who's at uh, the University of Nebraska Kearney. Um, and basically, the, 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 the quick story with one year pilot data is recovery of everything that happens in the soil is very, very fast. So we go two years of intensive grazing. As soon as we give it a season of rest, everything that changed because of that grazing comes right back to where it was. So soil respiration, which is like the, a measure of the microbial activity going on in the soils, it gets cut in half during those two years of grazing. And as soon as you give it rest, it comes right back to where it was. Um, the root colonization by fungi, same thing. Gets cut in half during the grazing period, but it comes right back to where it was. It, it's a full recovery, it looks like. And the root biomass is the really interesting one because you have about a five-fold decrease of root biomass when you really graze that stuff hard. But one season, it comes right back. Again, this is one year's data. It's pilot data. We've just started a full cycle four-year project. And so in four years, I'll tell you if that holds true. But there's no reason to think it doesn't based on the way we see pastures recover. We're not seeing pastures that look like they're degrading over time over the last 25 years of doing patchwork and grazing. But this is a really important thing for us to understand. It's not a, it's not a small piece, right? Soils are important. And then again, ecologically, we, we have the ability to protect things in a way that we don't. By the way, protecting things also means you can protect your, your burn patch for next year a lot easier. So if you do have a drought and the cows start going outside of where you want them to, and they're, they're punching holes in what you want to burn next year, just close the gate. And along those lines, there's no reason, like if you're uncomfortable letting those cows graze that first pasture too much all year, that's fine, close the gate whenever you get uncomfortable, just kick them out of there, right? It, there's no, it's not a template you have to follow if you wanna try this. You could graze that, that first pasture for two thirds of the season and let it rest for the last third of the season and graze the other ones harder, whatever, it doesn't matter. So this is the last slide. And, and basically, if I'm trying to be provocative, the reason I'm trying to be provocative is just to point out that the goal here should be heterogeneity, whether you're in a production standpoint or from wildlife standpoint, heterogeneity is the goal. Keeping trees out is part of that heterogeneity because we don't want it all to become trees. That's not heterogeneous. But fire isn't the magic solution to heterogeneity. Fire is one of the ways we can get to heterogeneity. And there's lots of other ways to do it. And this is just one of the other ways to do it. Sam, anything you would disagree with on that? No. Okay. So that's it for me. Questions, comments? Yes. If you weren't worried about eating standing vegetation in your, in your thing that has been rest for two years, would you consider paying it in the fall so that the following spring you wouldn't have all the decadent vegetation, you'd have new regrowth readily available for the, for the cows right out of the Uh, yes. Yeah, for sure. If I, if I didn't worry about winter cover in that particular pasture. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've done, um, well, where's Cody? Cody's in the back. Cody's done this too. We've done patch hay grazing, right? Where instead of burning, we just cut hay and then the, you get the regrowth from that and drive it. So yeah, if, if that was an objective, if you wanted to, st if you didn't want to start them on thicker grass, you could hay it beforehand. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Right. What do you see? Give us a little bit of insight as to what you see the difference is between just opening it all up, letting them pick and choose, creating, allowing three, three of your sections to have that benefit of that heterogeneity, of that, that, that choice versus doing the other systems throughout the season. From a heterogeneity standpoint or from a cow standpoint? Kind of, kind of nutrition and heterogeneity. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So season-long continuous grazing at a moderate stocking rate creates really nice heterogeneity, but it's static, right? 
if you're not burning out there, they're going to graze those same patches pretty much every year. So you always have short areas and tall areas in the same places, and they're fairly small patches, which is going to be okay for some wildlife and not for others, right? If you're an animal that needs a certain sized area of short structure, a lot of continuous, the, the grazing lawns may not be enough, enough size for what you need, right? Versus here, you can control the size of those patches of habitat, and you can have some bigger patches of the short and some bigger patches of the tall, which could be helpful for some animals. That's one difference. But I would say from the standpoint of actually retaining the one rest patch. Okay. Well, it's the, same. it's the same answer, except that you have a rest pasture over there, sure. Um, the other thing I think is from an from a animal choice standpoint, it probably is, is better to just open up all three of them and let them go where they want because they can choose what they want across a larger area. But I think this is a nice balance of letting them have a lot of choice and controlling when you need to give them more choice as they, as they need it, but also having more control over the size and the patchiness of the, of the habitat. I think it's a balancing act, basically. But you know, in, in this, just like in patch burn grazing, those cows have access to regrowth all the time that they need it, but they also have access to older grass if they want that, and they can bounce back and forth. Yeah.